This episode of Out of the Trenches was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Out of the Trenches is where I sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. Hi, Indy and the Great War Gang. I have a question for Out of the Trenches segments. Why did the Imperial German Army continue distributing the Pickelhaube even after the adoption of steel helmets? It was an obvious target and served minimal protection on the head. Thank you guys for your amazing work and greetings from Austin, Texas. Jared, Jared Enriquez. Okay, Jared, and another Texan boy. Um, <clears throat> the Germans wanted to completely replace all of the obsolete German Pickelhaube by 1916, but because of production limitations, this had to be done gradually. Pickelhaube materials had changed from 1915 onwards as well, as the German high command soon realized that they offered little protection on a modern battlefield. Thin sheets of steel were used to try to upgrade the existing model, but this was difficult to incorporate because of the complex design of the Pickelhaube itself and a shortage of materials because of the British blockade. This meant that the ersatz materials used were actually less effective and felt and even paper were used to replace the original leather. The spike, which was also an obvious target for enemy snipers, became detachable in the later models of 1915. Side note here, uh, the troops on the Western Front were primarily equipped with steel helmets, while distribution to the East and other fronts took longer. And the Pickelhaube helmets were still stored away and used during parades when high officials came to visit the front. Uh, Spartan80 writes, What role did the German Jäger Corps play in the war, and did the other countries have similar units? The German Jäger regiments had been made up of elite soldiers since the 18th century. The name Jäger literally translates as hunter, and often soldiers who served in these regiments had been professional hunters. Their uniforms slightly differed from the rest of the German army. They wore Schako helmets rather than the common Pickelhaube. They did try to adapt during the war. Um, many rode bicycles on the Eastern Front, and some were uh, equipped with skis. Both German and Austro-Hungarian Jäger forces, like the French Chasseurs, were designated light infantry, skilled and equipped for combat in woodland and harsh environments. And many had training in camouflage and sharpshooting. They were an elite force, designed to scout ahead, fight in deep woods or mountains, and harass the enemy. During the British retreat from Mons, soldiers reported being shot at by nearly invisible soldiers from behind bushes and on trees. Um, those forces were especially useful in an environment where large artillery pieces could not be transported or used effectively, like, say, in the Vosk, where the infantry still took the brunt of fighting. An example of a British version of these units would be the Lovat Scouts, who had originally been a Dragoon Regiment, were required to dismount their horses and became one of the British Army's new elite, sh elite sharpshooting regiments in 1916. Uh, they were also the first unit to wear the famous ghillie suit. Christopher Commons from Patreon says, he asks, I mean, why did Russia not have the same steamroller effect in World War I as they did in World War II? Okay, well, keep in mind, the Germans took far more Russian territory during the Second War than they did in the First. And, in fact, but the Russians managed to advance into East Prussia a considerable amount in 1914. Although the Eastern Front during the Great War was in many ways a prelude of what to expect during the Second World War, then you had, you know, the really clearly visible, visible ethnic tensions the Germans dealt with both Russian soldiers and civilians with far greater brutality in the Second War, as they saw that war as a, a battle of ideologies and a struggle between races, right? There was, though, uh, because of that, a far greater incentive for ordinary Russians to fight in the Second World War than there was in the First, as far more was at stake, specifically their own lives as well as those of their families. In spite of initial patriotic sentiment, as the Great War dragged on, it became harder and harder for officers of noble birth to coerce peasants and workers to continue fighting. 
Even though the Germans were still nowhere near the gates of St. Petersburg as they were in 1941, the ordinary Russian populace wanted political reforms back home rather than to carry on fighting for a cause they no longer really had faith in in many cases. This disillusionment was something that Britain and France had not taken into account at the beginning of the war. There was a naive belief that in spite of Russia's string of military blunders before the war, the country was unconquerable due to its size and population, but nobody considered the possibility that Germany wouldn't actually need to conquer the whole country, but rather break the resolve of the Russian people. Um, in addition to this, nobody could have anticipated that modern war would become a war of industrial production, a war in which Germany would easily outstrip Russia, which often couldn't supply its own soldiers with a rifle each or proper clothes and equipment for the winter, and had a lack of proper railway infrastructure in the border regions. A similar problem afflicted the Russians during the Nazi invasion. That was eventually rectified. Now. The Brusilov Offensive, Russia's offensive in 1916, did have such a steamroller effect, but it could not be exploited, partly by uncooperative commanders in the north, and partly due to the limitations of the First World War itself. You had no motorized armies, no, no T-34 spearheads, no, no combined offensive doctrine with aerial bombers, no real industrialized war economy. Not much help from allies. Um, no NKVD commissars who spurred the troops with ideological fierceness and, and you know, stuff like that. Uh, the German army of the Second World War was in many ways different than it had been you know, a generation before. It could pack a powerful punch, but did not have the capacity and the stamina of its predecessor. And it took the best of its commanders to repeatedly stabilize the Eastern Front each time it was penetrated. As I said at the beginning, this episode of Out of the Trenches was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, which is a great, as its name implies, a great video learning service that features lectures by professors from top universities from around the world and also experts from places like National Geographic or the Smithsonian. And for $14.99, you get access to all 7,000 video, video courses and you can learn something about pretty much any topic under the sun. Now, that last question, um, reminded me and Flo, actually, of one of their courses, which is about the history of Eastern Europe, a part of the continent which does have a rich cultural history, but which is often overshadowed by war or ethnic tensions. Veas Liu Levisius gives you a really good overview of this region from before the Middle Ages until the time following the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it's a really great overview, and, well, we certainly learned a lot from that. If you visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash thegreatwar, or follow the link in the video description, you can start a one month free trial in which you can watch all of those great videos. And while you're doing so, you are also supporting this show. And by the way, now that we have recommended three lectures in three of these calls to action, please tell us which ones you enjoyed and why you enjoyed them. And maybe we can find something great to recommend next time. See ya.